What happened for the DevOps space in 2021? Yep, it's that time of the year. These are the top 10 DevOps related news of 2021. Hey, welcome back to Career Day, where we talk about DevOps, especially with GitHub and Azure DevOps. If you've been following the channel for a while, you know that this set over here is where I normally deliver the news. And in fact, this is a news video. But you also probably know that I normally sit on a couch, but we are moving, so this is all I get. All right, so these are the top 10 DevOps news for me in 2021. Um, if you have any other news that you think it's important or that you want to share, just feel free to comment down below because I, I want to know what you think. And also, the news are not sorted in any way or form. So if one comes before another, it doesn't mean that it's more important or less important. So with this in mind, let's move on. As a general note, this year has been great for DevOps tooling, but not so much for DevOps adoption in general. And in fact, the DORAS report for 2020-2021 shows modest DevOps gains in comparison to 2019. There has been only a 6% increase in the number of elite performers in the last two years, even though the high performer grew about 17%. Not bad, of course, but could be better. I'm not sure if the growth has been limited by the pandemic, for example, but all the analysts were expecting a bigger numbers. What is interesting, in my opinion, though, is the number of organizations that are reportedly using SRE practices, about 52% of the respondent to the study, even though only 10% of the elite performers reported to have implemented the totality of the practices, which means there is still a lot of room for growth. All right, let's jump to the first news which is uh, quite recent and came fairly unexpected. I'm talking about GitHub CEO Nat Friedman stepping down from the role. In an internal post, subsequently published also publicly on the GitHub's blog, Nat Friedman announced that he was stepping down as a CEO of GitHub after about three years or more than three years. In the same post, Nat also announced the latest figure about GitHub usage, 73 million of active developers and about 84% of Fortune 500. And on the same day, the company also announced the new CEO, again with a post on the public blog. It's Thomas Domke, who was previously Chief Product Officer. Thomas has joined GitHub in 2018 together with Nat, and was until now in charge of very important programs like the GitHub Archive, the Pandabot, Codespaces, Copilot, and even the NPM acquisition. In the post, Thomas assured that GitHub will remain an independent outfit within Microsoft and that it will retain its developer-first values, distinctive spirit, and open extensibility while supporting developers in their choice of any language, license, tool, platform, or cloud. Well, good to know that. Who knows what GitHub will have for us in the coming months. All right, still talking about GitHub, but now a more technical news. In fact, during GitHub Universe 2021 in October, the company announced that GitHub Actions will now support OpenID Connect to authenticate to cloud resources. And this is important because the usage of OpenID Connect, OIDC, solves a long-standing problem that affects all the CI-CD platforms. CI-CD workflows, in fact, are often designed to access a cloud provider in order to deploy software or use the cloud services. To access these resources, the workflow will supply credentials, such as password or tokens, to the cloud provider. And these credentials are usually stored as a secret, and the workflow presents this secret to the cloud provider every time it runs. And here lies the problem, because using those hard-coded secrets requires you to first create those credentials and secrets in the cloud provider, and then duplicate and store them in your CI-CD platform, in this case, GitHub. But with OIDC, you can take a different approach. You can configure your workflow to request a short-lived access token directly from the cloud provider. Your cloud provider also needs to support OIDC, of course, on their end, and you must configure a trust relationship that controls which workflows are able to request that access tokens. Other benefits of using OIDC is that uh, you can get much more granular control over the conditions for issuing those tokens, and also that the tokens are very short-lived, as I said before, and they last only the time for the run execution of your CI-CD workflow, and that increase security, of course, and eliminate the need of credential rotations. Providers that currently support OIDC with GitHub includes AWS, Azure, GCP, and HashiCorp Vault, but more will be added in the near future. OK, enough talking about GitHub. Let's move to the third news, but still talk about security. During its annual conference in October, Sneak, which is one of the leading companies focusing on DevSecOps, announced a massive expansion of their toolset. Sneak Code has added support for C++, C Sharp, Elixir, Ruby, PHP, and Go. 
Snake Open Source has been extended to provide native integration with Atlassian Bitbucket and AWS Code Pipeline platforms, while at the same time tightening the integration with DigitalOcean and HashiCorp. Support for package managers Yarn2 and Poetry has also been added, alongside with integration with C++ scanning tool from FOSS ID. On the other hand, the Snyk container platform is now integrated with the open source Trivi container scanning tool and with Snyk's vulnerability database, in addition to adding support for container registry such as Quay, GitHub Container Registry, GitLab, Google Artifact Registry, and Harbor. The Snyk Infrastructure as Code platform now also makes it possible to detect configuration issues in Kubernetes manifest in Terraform code in a way that is compatible with cloud platforms from AWS, Azure, and GCP. And finally, Snyk launched both a new free developer security education program, dubbed Snyk Learn, through which developers can attain and measure their level of DevSecOps expertise, and Snyk Impact, an effort to foster collaboration among developers involving a wide range of socioeconomic issues. If you want to know more about Snyk and the toolset they provide, check out the complete review I made a while back. You can find a link up here and in the video description. Next up, a very interesting news about Azure. Microsoft, in fact, during the Ignite 2021 conference, has announced the public preview of something called Azure Chaos Studio. As the name hints, with the Chaos Studio, you can practice chaos engineering because it enables you to orchestrate fault injection on your Azure resources in a safe and controlled way. Chaos Studios is a fully managed service, so it doesn't require you to do any management or maintenance of the service. And of course, it is deeply integrated into Azure, leveraging ARM templates, Azure Policy, Application Insights, and Azure AD for RBAC. It uses a full library that covers several Azure services and replicates real-world scenarios. It does even allow you to roll back the fault being injected to avoid having more impact than originally intended. Chaos engineering is not always easy to do, and it is especially difficult making it properly, meaning without taking down the whole production, so it's an extremely interesting product for me. And if you're interested in the product as well, consider subscribing because soon I'll have a video about it. But Azure is not the only cloud platform that announced something major this year. In fact, AWS, during their reimagined conference, announced the availability of DevOps Guru, a new platform that should enable operations to identify issues that can be affecting their applications. The way it works is that it collects and analyzes data from application metrics, logs, and events to identify behaviors that deviate from normal operations patterns. When it finds a problem, the service can send an SMS, Slack message, or other communications to the team and provide recommendations on how to fix the problem as quickly as possible. This service gives AWS a product that would be competing with companies like Sumo Logic, Datadog, and Splunk by providing deep operational insights on applications, performances, and issues. All right, we are halfway through the news. If you made it this far and you're enjoying this video, hit the like button below so more viewers can benefit from this video. And of course, that would mean a lot to me. Thank you. Next news is about Salesforce. Now, I know what you're thinking. Really, a news about Salesforce in a top, top 10 DevOps news for 2021? Well, I would normally agree with you, but I think this time they have something going on here. In fact, at its online conference in June, Salesforce unveiled a DevOps Center pilot that provides a portal through which organizations can track and manage changes to Salesforce applications, including work items and pipelines that should be fully configurable. In addition, Salesforce added Salesforce functions to enable developers to deploy code in a serverless environment using any code. Or so they said, at least. But they've also announced a new command line interface, CLI, to manage all of their services and applications. And being a unified CLI, it should allow you to work with and automate all of Salesforce and Heroku at the same time, including the new functions. Also because it appears that the only way to create the new Salesforce functions is actually via the CLI. Finally, Salesforce also added a new service called Einstein Automate, which promise to use uh, machine learning models and AI to automatically integrate data and automate workflows. I've never been a huge Salesforce fan, and especially about Salesforce application development, but I really think that uh, bringing new and more DevOps feature to their platform is a good thing. What do you think? Let me know in the comment section below. Now, as usual, there are good news and bad news. And in this case, the news is kind of bad, even though I think it made much more noise than it should have had in the industry when it came out. I'm talking about Docker dropping the support for the free tier of the Docker desktop. In a blog post on the 31st of August, 
Docker CEO announced that the use of Docker Desktop in large businesses now requires a pro, team, or business paid subscription. Where large businesses for them means companies with more than 250 employees or more than 10 million US dollars in revenues. And as part of this announcement, Docker has also changed their or updated their plans and pricing. They have renamed their free plan to personal. And while there are no changes to the $5 a month pro and $7 a month team subscriptions, a new $21 a month business subscription has been created, adding features such as centralized management, single sign-on, and enhanced security. As I've said before, I think this news made much more noise than necessary, and this is for two reasons. The first one is that there has actually haven't been any impact in the Docker engine or to the Docker CLI, and in fact, both are still free. And second, the majority of the Docker workloads actually uh, run on Linux, especially on bigger businesses and platforms. And uh, Docker Desktop instead works only on Windows and macOS. So not a big deal if you ask me. Next up, let's talk about GitLab. Because at the beginning of the year, they actually announced that they would get rid of their cheapest plan. In a blog post, GitLab's co-founder and CEO, Sid Subrandri, um, apologies for the name, announced that they were phasing out the bronze starter tier because, and I quote, the bronze starter tier does not meet the hurdle rate that GitLab expects from a tier. In other words, GitLab decided that they were not making enough money out of the $4 per month per user subscription plan. The effect of this change, though, is that any feature that were previously present in the bronze tier and that are not part of the free tier have been moved up to the premium tier, which is almost five times more expensive than the starter tier was. Luckily, the free tier, which is the most popular option for GitLab, at least in terms of active users, will still remain in place. But it only comes with a very limited CI CD credits and with no support options at all. And still on the negative side, and I promise this is the last negative news, I want to talk about Jira. This is not so much of a news, but more of a market trend. Because in 2021, in fact, we had a lot, a lot of feedback, negative feedback and negative news about Jira. And I mean a lot. So much so that someone has even created an entire website dedicated to this called Why Jira Sucks, which at the time of recording lists the 31 biggest complaints Jira users have. There has even been a video campaign on YouTube in which Jira was depicted an employee and there was an HR person trying to fire them, listing all the problems and downsides they have. I have to say that it was kind of funny to watch, but I felt bad for Atlassian. And the situation on Twitter isn't better, with countless tweets of angry and frustrated users that use the platform to express their thoughts. I hope that the recent move of Atlassian to basically deprecating all the on-prem server offerings they have, including Jira, and moving all the users to their cloud platform will allow them to bring more innovations and fix the problem they have. They do deserve better. All right, last news of the year, and this is about HashiCorp, the maker of Terraform, Vault, Console, and many more, because this has been a great year for them. HashiCorp has not only been recognized as the winner of the 2021 Microsoft Open Source Software on Azure Partner of the Year, but has also been named number four on the 21 Forbes Cloud 100 list. Anyway, that was not the news. The real news is that in June, HashiCorp has finally released the long-awaited version 1.0 of Terraform, which is the de facto standard multi-cloud ISC solution. The GA of the version 1.0, of course, brings a ton of improvements to the system, including an improved experience for both usage and upgrade, and better interoperability, scalability, and stability. And with this milestone, Terraform Cloud has now the ability to run checks for third-party integrations, ensuring security, compliance, and cost management best practices. All right, these were the top 10 DevOps-related news for 2021 for me. As I've mentioned before, let me know in the comment section below if I've missed something that you consider important, and also which one was your favorite news of the year. This is my second to last video for this year. The next and last will be released on the 31st of December and will be a special video, so stay tuned for that. With this, I wish you all a prosperous new year, and I hope that 2022 br will bring you joy. Also, I want to thank you again for your continuous support. All of this wouldn't be possible if not for you. These are the 10 top, the 10 blah, blah, blah. All right, so these are the ton. You can get a much, much. All right, we are, we are. Huge year for consult. No, no, for HashiCorp. 
cost management, and I don't remember. But that's it for me. Thanks so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed it. Hit the like button below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I see you in the next video here at Code Dave. Thank you. Oh,